Welcome to This is CDR, episode 72. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, this is CDR is an online event series presented by OpenAir to contextualize carbon removal for policy proposals OpenAir seeks to develop and um, advance, basically at every level of government here in the U.S., as well as in national and subnational jurisdictions globally. My name is Toby Bryce. I work with uh, CDR Policy and Market Development with OpenAir based in Brooklyn, New York. If you haven't done so already, please say hey in the chat and tell us where you're zooming in from and direct that message to everyone and not just host and panelists so that everyone in the audience can, can hear from you. Um, just some quick background on open air. We're an all-volunteer network dedicated to advancing um, equitable and responsible deployment of carbon removal globally. Um, we work together on shared open source missions in the areas of policy, innovation, communications, and activist market development. Um, there's a bunch of links in the chat to uh, our website, to our Twitter. You can follow us on Twitter. You can join our group via a join form on our website. Uh, just some quick visual uh, representation of some of the projects we work on. We call them missions. We have a few dozen of active projects and it's totally open source. You can start your own projects, pitch in on any project you're interested in. We'd love to have you be a part of what we're doing. Two really important current projects we're working on are policy um, pieces of legislation, CDR legislation here in the U.S. There's a bill in California called SB 308, the California, sorry, the CDR Market Development Act. And it's a really uh, innovative uh, compliance mechanism for scaling carbon removal in the state of California. Um, Chris Neidel, who is our founder, is running the chat and he will put a link in the chat to a very simple call tool um, that you can use to contact your legislators and specifically your assembly member. The bill has passed the Senate in California, which is pretty amazing. And it is in the assembly now. So we really, any you know, these calls are super impactful. So we'd love to have you help us out with that. Similarly, we have a CDR procurement bill in Massachusetts that is also um, advancing, and it has committee hearings in both the Senate and the Assembly the second week, I believe, of July. So really happening right now as we speak. And again, your calls can be super impactful. So if you live in the state of Massachusetts, uh, please, there will be a form in the chat to make calls there as well to both Senate and Assembly. Before we get started, we always uh, just want to talk about our terms here. This is a definition of carbon removal from a great resource to learn about carbon removal called the CDR Primer. It's also essentially the same definition that the IPCC uses and one that we think should really be extended to policy across the world. Um, it's purposeful human activity to remove CO2 from the atmosphere and durably store it in geological, terrestrial, or ocean reservoars or in long-lived products. Two really important points to um, talk, to call out up front whenever we talk about carbon removal. Number one is to disambiguate C CDR from quote unquote CCS or quote unquote carbon capture, um, point source carbon capture, which is capturing CO2 from a fossil carbon emission source like a cement plant. This may or may not be a good um, climate solution, depending on its techno-economic and socio-political context. But one thing it's very much not is carbon removal, um, which is removing CO2 from the atmosphere. And these terms are often used interchangeably in the media and elsewhere, and it's really important to um, disambiguate them. Number two, whenever we talk about carbon removal, you need to call out from the rooftops that carbon removal is in no way, shape, or form um, any sort of substitute for a strong prioritization on reducing emissions. We need to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions and decarbonize our economy as quickly and as completely as possible, full stop. It's 90 plus percent of our climate work. And I would go on to add that without 90 plus percent emissions reductions, carbon removal will serve no purpose because there will be way too much CO2 continuing to be emitted in the atmosphere. <laughs> Purpose for carbon removal is to balance out the quote unquote residual emissions, which are those um, emissions that we cannot abate in a climate relevant time frame, primarily from agriculture. Again, five to 10 percent of global emissions. And um, there's clear scientific consensus that this quantity will be billions of tons a year that we'll need to remove from the atmosphere by mid-century. So it's a gigaton scale challenge. Um, we're currently at kiloton scale, tens of kilotons in terms of carbon that we're moving from the atmosphere. So we have a lot of work to do, which is why we're here and why we're working on this, uh, what, the work that Open Air does and the purpose of this, uh, this is CDR series. I'm going to kick it over to my colleague, Mega Raghavan, who is going to talk a little bit about run of show and introduce today's presenters. Hey everyone, I'm Mega Raghavan. Uh, I work on policy development and market uh, support as well in London um, and do work around Europe and the US. 
Um, so yeah, as usual, we'll start with a short presentation, which will be followed by a few prepared questions um, and then moderated audience Q&A. So please type any of the questions that you might have uh, throughout the presentation into the Q&A box. Um, please do find the one labeled Q&A. It's separate from the chat box and that just helps us to manage the questions and keep track of um, all the things being asked. Um, we're also recording the event, so we'll send the video link to all of you who registered and we will post it to OpenAir's website and to our YouTube channel. Um, this week on the CDR, we're very pleased to welcome Hannah Bevington and Scott Litzelman from Stratic Climate to discuss the Frontier's newly launched offtake program. Frontier's an advanced market commitment to buy an initial $925 million uh, of permanent carbon removal between 2022 and 2030. It was founded by Stripe, Alphabet, Shopify, Meta, McKinsey, and tens of thousands of businesses using Stripe Climate. Um, just about our two presenters, Hannah Bebbington is the strategy leader at Frontier, and in her current role, Hannah is focused on building a robust, large-scale voluntary market for permanent carbon removal. She's helped to raise and structure the advanced market commitment, now known as Frontier, and is now focused on effectively developing uh, and deploying the capital into large offtake agreements. Um, prior to Stripe, Hannah worked at Thrive Capital, Impossible Foods, and Bain and & Company, and she received her BA from Brown University and her MBA from the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Scott Litzelman is a program lead, lead at Frontier. He has a PhD in material science and engineering, and prior to Frontier was a program director at ARPA-E in the U.S. Department of Energy, where he ran R&D programs on direct air capture, points of CCS, and long duration energy storage. Uh, so to our presenters, whenever you're ready, over to you. Okay, hey everyone. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, we're really excited to be here. I am gonna get our presentation up. Can you guys see this? Yeah, that's good. Okay, great. Um, great. Well, thank you, Mega, Toby, and Chris for having us. Um, we're big fans of This Is CDR, and a bunch of our team and our portfolio companies have been on this program before, so really honored to be here today. Thank you for having us. Um, we know that a bunch of folks in the room are pretty familiar with Frontier and the Advanced Market Commitment, so you know, what we're really excited about doing today with this presentation is introducing Offtakes, our large multi-year, multi-million dollar purchase agreements that we expect to use to deploy the lion's share of the capital in Frontier. And so as not to bury the lead, we're really excited to talk about Charm, which is the first Offtake agreement that we just announced a couple of weeks ago. So without further ado, we are going to get into it. We'll give a very brief introduction of what we do. We'll talk about the role that large offtake agreements take in bringing new technology to market. And then Scott's going to talk about how we think about diligencing and structuring these, these first offtake agreements here at Frontier. So... This is not a surprise to anyone on the phone. We know in order to get to our global climate targets by 2050, we are going to need permanent carbon removal at gigaton scale in the next 25 years. We are wildly behind in this journey. We have done fewer than 10,000 total tons of permanent carbon removal to date. And so part of the effort in getting this technology on the right track is getting new early customers to help new technology come to market. This has been seen in a bunch of different industries before. So early customers help bring solar panels and hard drives and DNA sequencing to market. And part of the work that we are doing with Frontier is to be those early customers for carbon removal, hoping to accelerate its time to scale. We launched Frontier, the advanced market commitment to buy just over a billion dollars of permanent carbon removal in April of last year. As Megan mentioned, we originally founded this with Stripe, Alphabet, Shopify, Men, and McKinsey, and we've recently been joined by Autodesk, H&M, JP Morgan, and Workday. Uh, advanced market commitments have been used in the public health sector to uh, accelerate vaccine development and distribution to developing countries. This is the first time the advanced market commitment structure has been used in climate and certainly in carbon removal, and the intent is to get a large uh, demand signal spread to the carbon removal market to say, to carbon removal entrepreneurs and investors, if you build it, we will buy it. Frontier has two funding tracks. So we think about deploying the billion dollars in two ways. One is in pre-purchases. This is These are small dollar checks paid upfront to really early stage suppliers. It is meant to get new carbon removal companies started and to the, finishing, to the starting line. Uh, the second is our offtake program. Offtakes are large, multi-year, multi-million dollar purchase agreements that are pay on delivery. 
This is how we expect the lion's share of our fund to be spent and is used to get really promising carbon removal solutions to scale. Um, we made our first pre-purchases from the Frontier Fund in 2022. We now have 11 pre-purchase companies in our portfolio. Many of these folks have either been on This Is CDR or are going to be on This Is CDR in the next couple of weeks. Um, we have also just announced our first offtake. So we are super excited to uh, have Charm join the Frontier portfolio as an offtake uh, company. We collectively are buying $53 million of Charm carbon removal. So as a group of Frontier buyers, we expect to remove 112,000 tons of uh, carbon dioxide between 2024 and 2030. Uh, Charm is taking waste biomass, uh, often corn stover, but sometimes um, from forestry management, and putting it through a pyrolyzer where it creates a bio oil that can be injected underground for permanent storage. Charm is part of the broader bikers pathway, so biomass carbon removal and storage, which we think has the potential to support gigatons of carbon removal in the near future. So super excited to talk about the Charm Offtake Agreement more in Q&A. Um, but we wanted to take a step back and talk about why these large offtake agreements are important in developing the nascent carbon removal market and more broadly, how we think about what an offtake agreement is in carbon removal. So if we take a brief step back, the reason why we started frontier, we built the advanced market commitment was really to get the carbon removal market on track to scale to the gigatons we think we're going to need by 2050. We do this by sending a strong demand signal to researchers, entrepreneurs, and investors that there is a market, there is demand for these technologies. The hope is that this demand signal accelerates the development of CDR technologies. So we get more shots on goal and those shots develop more quickly over time. And then the hope is that this results in creating net new carbon removal supply as opposed to competing over the small amount of carbon removal supply that currently exists. We think offtakes off are an important cornerstone of being able to do Frontier's work. So offtakes provide predictable revenue so that a company can build and invest in future capacity. They are they represent an important building block in a company getting to commercial operation. So as a new project is getting started, they do a lot of the engineering and siting work. So they are developing their project. They then have to go out and secure all of their customers. And often for nascent technologies like carbon removal, they need more than 80%, if not 100% of the demand on their facility fully contracted. And then with that, they can get investors to come in to actually fund the construction of the project. So securing customer offtake is a really critical component of getting new projects built and operating quickly. The yellow bar in the customer offtake journey here is where we hope Frontier will play. So we hope that we can sign our offtakes early in a carbon removal uh, company's journey so as to enable other buyers to join them and quickly fill out that offtake stack such that a company can raise the capital it needs and get to commercial operations in a relatively quick timeline. At Frontier, we talk about offtakes as take and pay agreements. So they are pay on delivery. The way an offtake looks for us is there will be an annual schedule with price and volume and buyers pay as that volume gets delivered. So you take the carbon removal and you pay for it. There are a few principles that we uphold as we think about these agreements. The first is that we want to sign really early in a project's scale-up journey, perhaps before all of the project details are finalized. If you go back to this, you can see that customer offtake can start almost in year one of a project's journey. And we use milestones as a way to sign early, but also build buyer confidence that the project will go ahead as planned. We pay for carbon removal when it's delivered. So as I mentioned, our contracts have an annual expected schedule of volume and price. As the carbon removal supplier delivers that carbon removal, the buyers will pay for it. 
and delivery includes an approved uh, protocol verifier and registry plan that will be in place before delivery. We want to ensure the maximum bankability that's possible for a supplier. So the use of a take and pay structure allows banks to underwrite those future revenues because they are contracted. We also want to ensure though that our capital is not tied up indefinitely. There are going to be lots of successes and failures in this nascent carbon removal market. We think that is part of accelerating the trajectory to scale. And so we want to make sure that if a technology is not ends up not being viable, that we can take that capital that was committed to that offtake agreement and redeploy it to other more viable technologies and projects. And then finally, our hope is that the Frontier offtake will become a more standard agreement that can work for lots of different types of carbon removal companies. So carbon removal companies across pathways, across scale-up strategies who are taking different financing approaches, and um, we hope to have somewhat of a template to share with the market. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Scott. That's a brief intro into how we think about offtakes at a high level. Okay, thank you, Hannah. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about now about how we make decisions on what we're gonna be purchasing from. Um, because as Hannah said, you know, Frontier is $1.25 billion. That's both a lot of money, but it's also not a lot of money. And so we want to be really um, upfront with the community about how we look at this when we look at applications. So next slide. So we use three lenses to evaluate purchases approach. So does this carbon removal approach meet our target criteria, which I'll show in the next slide. Um, execution, can the team deliver on the proposal given where the tech is today? And a portfolio, is this part of a diverse risk adjusted portfolio, not just one pathway of CDR? And one point is that when we talk about early stage pre-purchases and offtakes, we use these three lenses for both, but the process and the considerations are different. For pre-purchases, we're willing to take more risk, technology risk and early stage technology to try to get companies to the starting line. For offtakes, we're looking for, for fewer risk, but that's not to say no risk. Like even for offtake agreements, there's still a lot of risk, which I'll talk about in execution, uh, but it's just to say that the process that we use and how we think about this is very different, whether it's a pre-purchase or an offtake. Next slide. So the first lens is approach. And this is something that you've probably seen on our website. And this, is, this has been from the beginning of the program. This is what we look for fundamentally for a carbon removal approach. So first of all, durability. We want you know a thousand years, essentially permanent CO2 removal. We're looking for um, pathways that don't compete with arable land. We're looking for pathways with a potential for low cost. Now, it's not to say that it has to be $100 per ton right now, but we want to see a pathway to low cost as the company scales. We want to see the ability to scale up in capacity. Uh, there could be solutions that are niche solutions that are great, but can't really scale to hundreds of megatons or gigatons. We want that large scale uh, for maximum climate impact. And there's others around about net negativity and additionality, verifiability, environmental justice and safety and legality. These are all things that we think about for any application that we look at. And this is really the first thing we think about. Next slide. The second question we ask ourselves, we have a few questions actually, um, can the company build and operate what they're proposing? Um, and can a company scale up to, to, again, hundreds of megatons per year? And the types of questions that we'll think about is how experienced are the company personnel, like the, the team and the company itself? What kind of partnerships do they have? Are they leveraging somebody who's an expert in CO2 storage or um, engineering designs or things like that? What kind of data do they have? Uh, we want to see as much data as possible, especially for an off-take agreement. But again, we understand that companies aren't going to have a fully baked and ready system, that there's still going to be a development process. But we ask ourselves, what kind of a performance improvements are they assuming? Um, there are some jumps that we can believe, and then there are some jumps that require you know, two or three miracles, uh, and we view those projects very, very differently. And we also ask questions around, like, what's the manufacturing strategy to get this to scale? Um, next slide, Hannah. It's kind of a, a variation on this. Uh, this is the more dramatic way of putting it. And at first, I thought I was being maybe a little bit overly dramatic when I made this slide. But at the same time, if you're a founder of a CDR startup, maybe this is an underestimate of what you're feeling. But the, the point of this is really say, when we think about potential off-tape projects, we think a lot about what kind of you know, type road walking or, or what kind of jump it is. And we're looking for the right size. So there's a version of this that is too conservative. You know, if the high wire was two feet long and two feet off the ground, 
you know, that's not really a big accomplishment. Uh, we want to move fast and we really want to accelerate CDR to have the climate impact we want. Now, the other version of this is, is too big a jump. Uh, we've seen applications where companies, you know, have some data and it's promising, but, you know, it's still really early and that's the scale that they're proposing is maybe a bit unrealistic. So when we think about evaluating off-take applications, we're looking for sort of this, this balance of we want it to be aggressive. We want to move CDR ahead. And again, you know, as Hannah said, we want to do this early in the process. We want to take on some risk. But I think the biggest part is we want to be have our eyes open around what those risks are. So we spend a lot of time with our reviewers and applicants, you know, really trying to understand the, the risk of a proposal and saying, does this risk profile fit what Frontier is trying to do? And it's still early in our journey. So frankly, we're still kind of triangulating that. Next slide. And last thing is we want a balanced portfolio. So this slide is mostly from Frontier's pre-purchase program. This does include Charm, uh, but it shows a number of pathways, enhanced weathering, director capture, bikers, um, some storage only, some ocean CDR, and Synbio. And you know, the, the offtake you know, portfolio is still, you know, we only have one so far, but the intent is to do something similar. We want a portfolio of offtake approaches. It's not just going to be director capture or just bikers or enhanced weathering. We really want, uh, we really want a portfolio. Next slide. But to do that, there's some foundational work that still has to be done beyond just being a buyer. And these are things that, that Frontier and, and, and some of our partners were working on. Um, so one of the things we're working on are biomass sourcing principles. For biomass-based you know, CDR approaches like bikers, um, we want to make sure that we are sourcing sustainable biomass that considers upstream emissions and sort of leads to a positive and just climate outcome. Um, and that's something where, you know, sometimes that hasn't actually happened in the past. So it's definitely something that we're thinking about for bikers. Below that, enhanced weathering MRV. Enhanced weathering is one of those pathways that we're really excited about, um, but the MRV uncertainty is still higher. Now, that's not to say that we're not going to we're not going to buy from enhanced weathering. Like we're going to buy from enhanced weathering, but we're trying to develop a framework that takes into account what those uncertainties are so that we can write a bankable offtake agreement that we think is realistic. On the top right, we have things like DAC energy integration. This could be things like you know, heat-driven approaches versus electricity-driven approaches. DAC is incredibly energy intensive. And so you know, we're looking for, for ideas to minimize that as much as possible, but ideas that, you know, uh, are using very low carbon intensity electricity and thinking about how that's going to scale and how it's going to affect the broader energy system as it scales up. There's still a lot of work to be done in that, I think. And the last part is CDR policy engagement. Uh, we are engaged with you know, entities like the Carbon Removal Alliance and others because we really want to see um, CDR pushed in as many different directions in a technology agnostic way as possible. Next slide. So that's that's really the summary. Um, you know, the, I think the main points we want to tell you is, you know, we've talked about the early stage pre-purchases and the offtake program. So there's a few prongs to Frontier, and they're trying to do different things. We're still really excited about our pre-purchase programming. We're really talking about offtakes today, uh, but we're currently in the middle of our 23 purchasing cycle, and we're going to be, per, you know, adding new pre-purchase projects. We're really excited about them. They're super innovative, and you know, um, we're in the middle of that now. But a big focus of the next two years and really sort of the bulk of the spend when you see that $1.25 billion is going to be an offtakes. So this is the big thing that that's coming. Um, and if you're interested, um, please check out frontierclimate.com slash apply. We have a rolling offtake request for proposals and we're looking for expressions of interest. And, um, you know, Hannah and I, our job now is really just to try to, you know, find and scout and diligence um, a lot of really great companies. So with that, uh, thank you, and we're happy to take questions. Excellent. <clears throat> thank you both. That was really great and informative and appreciate you sharing that information. Um, we do have a few questions, many of them you already touched on, so there'll be more kind of expansion of a few points that you mentioned. Um, and we'll do a few prepared questions from open air, and then we will switch to audience questions. And we have quite a bit of time, so we should be able to, to cover quite a bit of ground. So, And please put your audience questions in the Zoom Q&A box, because it's very difficult to manage them if they're in two places. And there are a few that are in the chat, so please paste those into the Zoom Q&A box. Um, number one, I wanted to ask about MRV. Um, 
uh, and specifically delivery verification. Um, Frontier and Carbon Plan convened a meeting in November um, that actually many of the audience members were at, and or a number of them, and um, that resulted in a letter that, that we'll put in the chat highlighting the critical importance, generally speaking, of high quality independently administered MRV to scaling the sector. Um, I'm curious specifically how you are thinking about structuring delivery verification for your offtake purchases. Um, I know it's a little bit different for the pre-purchases, but for offtake, like where does that sit in the transaction? Um, I've heard sentiment from both buyers and suppliers actually that in, in an ideal world, verification is separate from the credit purchase um, from a structure from a transaction structure perspective, and and it's sort of contracted for and paid for by the buyer, so we don't have any incentive alignment issues um, with the seller verifying their own delivery. Um, but what are your thoughts on that, and what do you think is the ideal way to incorporate delivery verification into these offtakes? Yeah, so MRV is a really critical part of ensuring that the carbon removal that folks say is delivered is actually delivered. And as we think about a pay on delivery schema, which is how we build our offtakes, MRV is a really important part of characterizing what it means to deliver carbon removal. And so early in, in our offtake um, term, our suppliers will work with our buyers to finalize their protocol, their verifier for that protocol, and their registry plan to be used at the time of delivery. Um, we very clearly do this on a case-by-case -case basis because we don't believe that there are sort of market standards for the protocols, for the verifiers, for the registry in permanent carbon removal today. So at the same time that carbon removal technology is developing, so too is the MRV infrastructure. To get to your question specifically about how it works in our agreement, it's true that we like MRV costs to be separated from the cost of carbon removal. We think that this level of transparency will help drive uh, costs down and accuracy up within our MRV toolkit. So we like to separate out what, it, what the costs are of doing MRV across a variety of pathways. And we do have buyers pay for that separately. So it can either be directly buyers are paying the verifier for their work, or it's a pass through where they pay suppliers on top of the work of delivering the carbon removal in a really transparent way. We actually think the incentives are aligned regardless of whether you pay pass through or you pay directly, so long as the MRV costs are clearly separated. Got it. So you're kind of, yeah, I mean, ultimately the buyers are paying it kind of, I think, just where it sits in the transaction. And you're kind of agnostic to that as long as it is separate. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, like, suppliers are going to have a multitude of buyers and are probably going to be working with their protocol developer and their verifier and their registry across a variety of buyers. So in many instances, it makes sense for them to hold that relationship. So long as we are paying for the service of verification, not for a successful outcome. So it is more important to us that we are paying for verification, regardless of success or failure, not paying for tons. <laughs> makes sense. And well put. Um, this, I think, is a quick question, but I, I hear it a lot, so I'm going to ask you, um, and I don't think you specifically said it in your presentation, but practically speaking, will Frontier only consider existing Frontier and Stripe pre-purchases for offtake, or is a wider, or is there a wider consideration set? It's it's not just Frontier's um, pre-purchases. So, so just because the first offtake agreement was with Charm and Charm is part of it, um, that is not to say that we, we are definitely looking at companies that are not part of our program, both in our request for proposals last fall and our current one, we are evaluating and in the diligence process for a number of companies who are not part of the portfolio. So definitely, you do not have to be part of the portfolio. Got it. Excuse me. And we put a link to the RFP document in the chat, which is very useful. I think it really like spells out specifically kind of stage and what you're looking for. So I definitely encourage folks to take a look at that. Um to what extent do you factor, and you alluded to this a little bit by saying that you want to have the offtake happen early in the cycle rather than later, so that you're maybe the first buyer to help projects become more bankable. Um, to what extent does the more general catalytic effect of the offtake at a company or pathway level factor into your purchase decision? I mean, I know Charm was the first one, but Charm was also doing quite well. And maybe there are other companies for whom an offtake will be more catalytic or other pathways. Um, so is that an important factor or is that a what extent do you consider that? 
Yeah, I mean, catalytic offtakes is sort of the name of the game here. What we're trying to do is write purchase agreements in such a way that we are increasing the likelihood that we have carbon removal at gigaton scale in the next 25 years. So that takes a number of different forms. Like we want to be buying carbon removal across a variety of pathways, across a variety of prices. And so when we think about the catalytic nature of our offtake agreement for any specific one, we're thinking about how what is the value of Frontier's purchase for this specific company? And what is the value of Frontier's purchase with this company on the broader field? So when you take Charm, for example, you know, we are so early in the carbon removal market that there are many, many, many companies where a Frontier offtake would be catalytic, where any purchase would be catalytic. These organizations need to raise hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars of offtake revenue over the course of this decade in order to reach their scale up goals. And so Frontier is going to be a small, but hopefully meaningful part of that journey. Um, but yeah, we take into consideration, so how many other buyers do they have sort of circling this project? What types of co-product revenue do they have? What types of policy support do they have? So, you know, Charm today does not qualify for 45Q compared to a lot of our direct air capture um, candidates. And so there's lots of different ways that we think about catalyticness, but we certainly want to be making sure that we are moving the needle in terms of their speed and scale in market. Got it. Well put, and thank you. Um, and that all makes sense. A um, couple pathway specific questions. Um, first, about enhanced weathering. And I see that we have a few um, enhanced weathering practitioners in the audience. Um, I'm going to put, we're going to put two links in the chat to sort of preface the question. There's a really um, useful, I think, blog series from Di Ellis and John Sanchez about. Um, quote unquote, leveling the playing field for open system pathways, of which enhanced weathering is one, marine CDR another. Um, and then number two, a link to uh, Carbon Plan and Frontier's really excellent, I think, um, uh, verification framework. Um, but practically speaking, and you mentioned, Scott mentioned uh, enhanced weathering on one of the slides, but practically speaking, what does an enhanced weathering company need to do to qualify for offtake? Just given where we are now, the levels of uncertainty, you could frame it using the VCLs or however you would like to frame it, but like, to what extent are you willing, I guess, to factor uncertainty into an offtake um, and actually make a purchase? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And I think, you know, a big part of that Ellis Sanchez blog that you mentioned, it talks about the importance of having, you know, diverse pathways. And we fully agree. That's why we have this portfolio consideration. And I think the VCL framework is really this is this is the reason why it exists. Um, so there are there are pathways where there are uncertainties. We don't just say, oh well, we're not going to engage because we don't know everything. But rather, here's what we do know. This is our best estimate to date. To think about, it's really trying to sort of take those uncertainties into account. So for an enhanced weather applicant considering for an offtake, one of the things that we would want to see are really thoughtful MRV approaches. Um, and really with a focus on measurements. And quite frankly, that might be expensive now. Um, and you know, we're and that's one reason why I think Hannah said we want to sort of separate out MRV costs from the removal cost because we just want to be really transparent. And we might say, Frontier wants to pay for an overabundance of measurements right now because we need more de uh, data for models. And what that might mean between that and the uncertainty discount is that the net removal price might be higher. And that's something that we're willing to do if we think it accelerates the pathway. But it's also not something static. Like we expect that to come down over time. Like we expect, you know, hopefully companies can do it with um, either better technology or fewer measurements and the uncertainty. Uh, falls and sort of that premium for the net removal price, we hope will fall with time. But in the early days, um, we, again, we just want to be really transparent and, and just, I guess, try to quantify the uncertainty as best we can. And, and you're relatively, you're, so you're open to doing that in the relative near-term future, as opposed to feeling like we're way away from being able to do that. Yes. I mean, we're, we're very excited about enhanced weathering and we 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 want to be doing enhanced weathering all takes. Um, and similarly for marine CDR, is there any, it's sort of the same general question, but are there any specific points that you think would be diff a different, would you answer differently for marine C, and obviously marine CDR is broad, but let's talk about, you know, ocean alkalinity enhancement, mm -hmm. um, yep. or, or direct ocean removal, as we like to call it, um, like that rely on air sea gas exchange to, to actually execute on the carbon removal, which is, there's some uncertainty there, but like, is there a different way to think about marine CDR for those two? marine CDR pathways from your answer to enhanced weathering or is it sort of the similar issue? I think, 
I think there are some differences. I mean, marine CDR is also something that we're really excited about. We have a number of companies like Running Tide and Ebb and, and a multiple companies you know, across a number of marine pathways. We're really excited about that. I do think there are some differences. I think there are some ecosystem safety questions. I think there are some governance questions. Um, on Will Burns' podcast, there was there's a whole episode about sort of marine CDR governance. And so that's the type of thing where, again, we want to be um, purchasing from as many pathways as possible. That might be one where there's a few more um, things that need to happen. Like I had that, that, that slide of sort of like other things that we're trying to do to get CDR going beyond just buying. And I think for marine CDR, there's a few other foundational things that need to happen uh, to really facilitate that. Good point. Yeah, the governance is definitely a clear difference between those two pathways. Um, all right. I, you've already made one biker's purchase, so maybe you're not going to make another one in the very immediate term, but there's a big elephant in the room, at least when you're not working at Frontier, whenever Frontier comes up, and that's biochar. Um, there's a perception that you won't consider biochar. Um, I think there are assertions in the biochar world um, that biochar can have thousand year plus durability. Um, so just put it to you, like, what about biochar? Is bio, can biochar conceivably qualify for offtake or is it kind of out of the consideration set? So several years ago, we said biochar doesn't qualify because we don't think it hits our durability criteria. We had many, many people write to us and send scientific papers saying like, no, depending on how you process it and certain hydrogen and carbon ratios, uh, there could be very recalcitrant forms of biochar that do that certain fraction does hit that. Um, a number of people made that argument to us. And I think you know that's something that we've taken very seriously. Um, one of the things that we think about, and, and biochar has a lot of value. I mean, there's there's soil amendment value, there, you know, there's there's a lot happening, and there, there's just a lot of climate value there. One of the things that we think about is, is a metric we call CDR efficiency. So essentially how much carbon is removed relative to carbon sort of lost throughout the process. And that actually includes both anthropogenic emissions. So like grinding emissions or transport emissions, uh, but also biogenic emissions, like other sort of carbon loss in the process. Um, I think one of the challenges I think for biochar is in the pyrolysis process itself, a certain amount of carbon is lost. And I think specifically for the types of processing you need to get for that really recalcitrant biochar, it tends to result in lower carbon content. And so the ones that we've seen today, both in proposals to us, and I think the scientific literature, the CDR efficiency is on the lower side. And so I think we're, you know, it's one of the things that we prioritize because um, there's only sort of so much sustainable biomass out there. And we want to see that result in as much CDR as possible. So it's something that's sort of ongoing. I think in the current pre-purchase RFP, we said, you know, it's not a priority area. Uh, but again, we have people making a, a lot of arguments for us as to uh, yeah. why it could be a useful pathway. I think that's a very fair point. Um, and obviously there are, there are ways to store biochar. We have Carba coming on who are gonna mm -hmm. carry biochar. We had Ecolot come on who puts biochar in concrete. So the there are ways to address the permanence, but there is the fundamental carbon efficiency issue of the thermal conversion where you're losing at least 50% of the carbon off the top in most yeah. processes. So I think that's a, and that's a point yeah. that I think is not with respect with fairness to biochar that not everyone in the biochar community always acknowledges. So I think that's a really, that's a fair point to make. Um, one other biker's question, um, this is kind of a pet issue for me, but uh, with incumbent back systems that use dedicated production of biomass and often sit on top of, I think, bioenergy systems that are questionable from a techno-economic context, um, and we'll put a link to a, sort of an extreme example, but a New York Times article about um, bio, bio, uh, ethanol in the U.S., um, NextGen recently purchased the company called Summit Carbon Solutions, which is basically CCS sitting on top of ethanol in the Midwestern part of the U.S. Is that something that you could notionally consider or would you, obviously one of your criteria are land use, land use considerations. Um, and like, how do you, when you look at BEX with dedicated biomass, how do you look at the systems boundary and then the underlying techno-economics and life cycle analyses of the underlying systems? This is a great question. And I think in general, when it comes to the backs and bikers, I think we see a lot of climate potential, but also a lot of risks. And so something that we've been thinking about a lot. And the way that we do this, we think about it on a few levels. So one, you mentioned, right, um, one of our approach criteria is physical footprint. And it says, you know, we will not be competing with arable lands. Um, and so we do not consider dedicated energy crops. Uh, we don't consider tree plantations that are managed solely for producing bioenergy. Um, that is not something we would look for. That, that's not something we would purchase from. Uh, we're really looking for waste and residues. Uh, so that's the first one. Um, the second one is you, you mentioned sort of the LC and the boundaries, and those are really good points because I think um, one of the things that we think about is what's the storage counterfactual. 
Um, you know, if it's something that's a large diameter stem wood that would have retained its carbon for decades to come, um, we think it's problematic to call that CDR now. Um, we also want to be really comprehensive in how we draw the LCA so that we count those upstream emissions. I think sometimes you'll see people say like, well, it's biomass, so, you know, it's carbon neutral. So if you're doing CDR, now you're carbon negative. Um, that could be the case, but I think you just have to actually do the LCA and account for those upstream emissions. Right. Because if bikers is carbon removal, then the photosynthetic drawdown is within the system boundary and you need to, you need to account for that. Um, cool. Um, one last question just about policy. You mentioned policy and carbon removal alliance policy, something that open air works on quite a bit. And, you know, we've collaborated with Frontier on a few or Stripe mainly, I guess, on a few points. Um, and I would say that the sort of foundational procurement program at Stripe has been very in influential and, and, public procurement of carbon removal. Um, how do you think specifically about policy? And are you, are you, are you more, there's the compliance model in California with SB 308, then there's the procurement model with a couple of federal bills and open air state level CDR leadership act procurement policy. Um, what are your thoughts on kind of where policy should prioritize in terms of supporting carbon removal, long duration carbon removal? So we should, you guys should have a deep dive with Jane Flagel on our team who leads policy and market development. She is far and away the expert on this. But what I will say is their policy is going to be a critical component of scaling the carbon removal market. When you think about carbon removal operating at three to four billion tons a year in 2050, you know, at hundred dollars a ton, that's 300 to 400 billion dollars a year of procurement dollars. So there's sort of no universe where we can get to those climate targets without a really robust uh, policy re regime. But that policy regime is sort of going to be multi-pronged in nature. So we need to think about what are the policies we have in place to get more carbon removal companies started. So what are sort of the basic R&D grants that we're doing or sort of the more academic or scientific programs that we're standing up to how are we getting new first of a kind technologies to scale? So what are we doing in terms of helping them cross the valley of death from a financing perspective? What are we doing to accelerate their path to permitting? And then beyond that, how do we think about procurement at scale, be it directly by the federal government or encouraged by the federal government or mandated by the federal government? Sort of, There's lots of different flavors of that. I think the IRA has been just sort of an amazing and accelerant for a bunch of different climate technologies, to state the obvious, um, but certainly for carbon removal as well. And I think where we go from here could take a number of different directions. Excellent. Um, thank you for those thoughts. And um, we have approaching 30 audience questions. We probably won't be able to get to all of them. And we did cover a few of them in the prepared questions, but I think Meg is going to come on now and, and start asking some audience questions. But thank you for uh, for answering those questions. Hey, guys. Yeah, we definitely, unfortunately, have more than we can cover, but I will do my best. Um, the first, just a few questions on what is in scope. Um, one person asked, a couple people asked, actually, um, are you looking at greenhouse gases other than carbon dioxide at all? And if not, if so, you know, where are you thinking? And if not, what's the rationale for that? So I'll go ahead, okay. Scott. Uh, we are only really focusing on CO2. And I think one of the things that our colleague Zeke Housefather likes to talk about is, is like for like. Um, and so, you know, we see this as being about both getting to net zero as far as like, you know, um, any residual CO2 emissions after we've decarbonized as much as we can, and then going net negative. Um, so we're really only focusing on CO2 so that, that it's like for like. Okay, got it. Yep, makes sense. Um, and then what about you mentioned not wanting to do uh, dedicated energy crops. And this person asked about just the fact that, they, you know, you can get higher energy density, essentially, or crop density if you're growing it for purpose. Um, is there like, is there ever a case where you think that would make sense? Or is it just sort of a, a hard and fast rule that you'll only look at residue? Um, and I mean, different groups have approached this differently, and it could change over time. I mean, I've certainly heard people talk about like switchgrass and marginal lands and, and things like that. Uh, so it's not to say like our definition is the only definition, I think, but especially I think for starting for really the first few bikers projects, we're taking a more conservative approach. Okay, fair enough. Um, and then specifically, a couple of people asked about the idea of bio oil. So, you know, obviously, that's paralysis as well. It does does what uh, Charm is doing have a significantly higher uh, carbon efficiency, as you put it? And, you know, without giving up 
anything you're not allowed to give up. Um, um, can you just compare it, it, the it two does. a little bit? Yeah, so, so okay. I, can't, I can't get into the exact value, yeah, but churn does enough. have a higher CDR efficiency and also I think higher certainty around that. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, a couple of other questions were on like the storage side of things. So, you know, when you think about durability, obviously, like, are you evaluating DAC or is it DAX with the storage component kind of considered to be a part of the pathway? And how do you split those two sort of components of the, the process up? Um, it's a pretty comprehensive drawing. So it would be the DAC, but it would also be the storage. So, you know, if somebody's applying to for an offtake, you know, it's not to say they have to have like a storage agreement sort of finalized, but we want to know who are you talking to, what are their experience, how, you know, what kind of formation is it, or how are you going to store it? Uh, the, the durability, and I, I saw a few questions around sort of like charm and um, and like degradation. I mean, durability is one of the things that we really focus on in the diligence memo to make sure that the that the removals are permanent. Right. Okay. And just thinking of that kind of thousand year plus durability, how do you actually deal with the longer term risk? You know, once a company hits the milestone, you've triggered the payment, like how do you deal with the eventual risk of a longer term default on that long, long, quite, you know, quite long obligation? It's a good question. I, I think, I think we're, we're really, the ones that we're starting with, we're starting with very high verification confidence levels and ones where I think there's been an extensive body of work to try to understand what those risks are. So for example, geologic sequestration, um, there are risks associated with that around like leak it, you know, legacy wells or seismic events, things like that. Uh, but there's been a substantial body of work, you know, hundreds and hundreds of papers on trying to understand those risks and how do you mitigate them? So if we think about like a, a DAC or a BEC thing, you know, we'll look to see like, again, sort of, are they is what they're proposing in line with scientific uh, evidence. For something like enhanced weathering, um, there are risks of some reversal, like like secondary carbonate precipitation. But at the same time, you know these are pathways where eventually you're getting bicarbonates and you know bicarbonate storage in the ocean. Ultimately, you know that's something that's considered to be a very stable, you know, more than thousand years type solution. I right. Okay. Two, yeah, two things there. So one is very, very philosophically, we are looking at, as Scott just mentioned, categories of technologies, which we think are sort of physiologically permanent and don't rely on social or market mechanisms to ensure permanence over time, um, which I think is unique in the permanent carbon removal market. Um, and two, the VCL framework that we published with Carbon Plan is one way that we ingest the level, the variety of uncertainties across pathways. So we think about discounting the number of tons that are delivered based on a range of different factors that um, could reduce that ultimate number. So we're trying to take a very conservative approach to quantifying what we even consider delivered in the first place. Yeah, and the the VCLs, I think it's a super helpful way of looking at it and everyone should check that out if you haven't already. Um, we had a couple of questions on the like financing side of things. So one question was just in general, are you seeing that banks and you know lenders are looking at the fact that Frontier has done an offtake or a pre-purchase and that is helping them to underwrite loans? Like, is that something you're already starting to see? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think we spend a lot of time with potential project finance investors in the carbon removal space. I actually think it's a combination of the IRA has piqued a lot of interest in carbon removal um, and not just Frontiers deal. So you see a bunch of other buyers who are sort of getting into the space, which is improving sort of the overall commercial viability of these projects. The last thing I'll say is it's pretty important for our suppliers that they're able to raise more institutional capital that's much cheaper than just funding off balance sheet with corporate equity. And so very quickly, as our suppliers are starting to build bigger and bigger facilities, there just happen to be more traditional investors at the table um, by virtue of their need in the first place. Um, but the whole point of the way we design our offtake agreements is to be underwritable by a bank. So the intent is to get to a place where a bank can use those contracted revenues as a way to improve confidence that they can, uh, you know, extend credit to these suppliers. Okay, got it. Um, we got quite a few people asking if you have or plan to publicize any of the offtake agreements, like, you know, either some kind of standard terms that people can look at or, or a specific existing contract. Um, is that something you're, you're going to make public at some point? Yeah, we talk about this a lot. Um, 
I think we will make it public at some point. We're not exactly sure when. We want to make sure that when we do make it public, it is sort of ready to be used in a more standardized way. And uh, I saw a question in the chat that said something like, we feel like we're learning all the time. Are you? And I would say like 100% <laughs> we feel like we are on a very yeah. steep deep learning curve. Um, as we do this, you know, Charm is just our first offtake agreement. And a lot of the lenders are investing in carbon removal for the first time. A lot of our projects are building big facilities for the first time. We are writing offtakes for the first time. Um, and so that's a long way of saying, yes, we will share it, but uh, TBD when. Okay, got it. And uh, yeah, are there any like specific challenges you've already started to encounter with creating a standard contract like that? Like I can imagine there's so much diversity in the pathways and within the pathways, like is there anything kind of popping out as a main barrier to standardizing that kind of thing? Yeah, there are many challenges. I think one of the sort of inherent tension, there are a couple of inherent tensions in the Frontier program that we are working on. So one is we want to sign really early in a carbon removal supplier's journey. We talked about being in the yellow bar on that. Gantt chart. Um, but that's often before all project details are finalized. So they might not know the storage partner that Scott mentioned or their site or their energy source. And so we're trying to figure out a way to add milestones to our contract in a way that gives buyers confidence that projects will go ahead as planned. But milestones are somewhat unique. Lots of renewable energy projects don't have to have that type of detail in them. And so that has been new. Another challenge I will call out is there is um, very different terms in these types of offtake agreements, depending on the financing strategy of our companies. So if companies, Charm, for example, went out and raised a Series B on the back of signing an offtake with Frontier. So their needs around what our offtake looked like is very different than some of our other suppliers who are trying to raise from large institutional uh, debt providers, for example. Um, and so finding an agreement that works for carbon removal suppliers across their journey, across their financing strategies, across pathways, um, has been a fun puzzle piece. Yeah, okay, lots, lots to think about there. Um, a couple of, I know you were saying maybe you guys are not the policy expert, but I think this is a pretty good high level question that is of interest to a lot of people. Um, do what do you think about like the idea of stacking 45 q credits and cdr revenues like and how do you think about additionality around that because i know we talk about financial additionality essentially sometimes and that you know i think that's an open question from a policy perspective yeah i mean we in the bluntest term and scott please hop in after me we think about would this project have gone ahead without our purchase so what is the value of frontier dollars in making sure that this project gets built or this new supply comes online. Um, 45Q has been extremely helpful in getting more direct air capture companies to the starting line, more direct air captures financed. Um, but when we think about the offtake dollars that they need to secure, um, the gap between 45Q and their actual costs is really wide. So 45Q today pays $180 per ton Many direct air capture companies range from $600 a ton to $1,500 a ton. And so it is still extremely important that those direct air capture companies are raising offtake from corporate buyers or private buyers in order to get their facilities built. This is actually true outside of direct air capture too. When you think about BEX projects, for example, there are lots of programs outside the U.S. that help subsidize those types of retrofits or um, sort of carbon removal programs, we think about how are corporate buyers part of the fabric of their offtake such that these projects get built. Okay, got it. Um, a couple of questions on like thinking about, I guess it's more on the pre-purchase front. Um, so when you're, you know, entering into a pre-purchase contract, how do you think about like the volumes and the prices you're buying? Because at that scale, it almost feels like, you know, that price isn't linked to like, a unit cost and the volume might just be whatever they can deliver. So is there like a minimum amount you want to purchase? And then how do you think about pricing that out in a way that makes some kind of sense? Sure. The, the, the pre-purchase program is very different. And, and to be perfectly candid, um, most of our pre-purchase um, amounts are just $500,000. And so, uh, you know, companies will yeah. propose a certain cost structure and a certain price to us. And that's, you know, a certain amount of volume they have. Sometimes it's less if they just don't even have that much volume available. Um, I mean, but you're right. It is very early. And sometimes the prices are high because 
it's being levelized over a system that's only operating for one year rather than 25 years. Um, so there are definitely some interesting artifacts there. We want to show that the price is coming down over time, but in these early days, it, that, that can be tricky. I think really a big part is just trying to say, what are the most promising approaches? How can we get them moving faster from the laboratory to the field and, and start delivering? But I think your, your point's very well taken. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Um, and then the last one I'm going to do is when you do, when you look at these offtake agreements, is the idea to sort of make multiple purchases over the lifetime as they scale up or prove more of their sort of um, their process working? Um, how do you see yourself kind of engaging over the lifetime of some of these different projects? So I think a dream scenario for Frontier is that we are their first customer in our pre-purchase program. They successfully deliver on that purchase. They hit their milestones. We do diligence for our offtake agreement. We get excited again and we write a multi-year offtake agreement with them. That type of graduation is sort of best in class from a frontier trajectory perspective. In terms of uh, how how we think about doubling down on offtake agreements, I think, you know, candidly, our our fund is quite small. So a billion dollars actually doesn't go very far in terms of accelerating the whole carbon removal market. So it is more likely that we will sign what we think is a sort of appropriately sized meaty offtake agreement with one supplier and then track them over the term of our fund and then hope that other buyers sort of come in for their next facilities as they come down the price curve. But that frontier will rather than double dip with a specific company will spread across a variety of high potential bets. Having some issues with my laptop, but um, that was the last of our, the audience questions that I was going to ask. So thank you guys so much for joining us. And Toby, I think hopefully you're able to take over from here. Yep. Thank you, Mega. And Thank you for all the great questions to the audience and for being with us. And especially thank you to Hannah and Scott for sharing an hour with us. And we was very exciting to learn more about the offtake program. And thank you also for answering some pointed questions and more generally for all the great work that you and your team at Frontier are doing to advance carbon removal. So thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. Yeah, thank you guys. Um, excellent. So we're gonna do a really quick uh close here. Um so I think. This is a, so you can see how the sausage is made. Um, Chris is having internet issues, but this was supposed to be a slide to um, announce the German version of this is CDR, which is launching next week. So I do not have the link for it, but stay tuned. We're going to put that out on Twitter. And if you're in Germany, we're going to have a German language, this is CDR with a former US, this is CDR guest, uh, Dr. Mario Schmidt, who is the CEO of Ecolact, which is a company that, uh, that incorporates biochar into concrete. And then... We have a bunch of great episodes coming up on This is CDR. Um, next week, uh, Stripe, or sorry, Frontier Pre-Purchase Arbor, which is a novel bikers company based in Southern California that uses space rocket technology to, um, to very efficiently gasify biomass and then capture the energy benefit from that process. We're going to be off for July 4th, American Independence Day. And then we have a great run of episodes coming up, uh, including, I think, a few other Frontier pre-purchases Aquatic, which used to be called Sea Change when they were on This is CDR in December 2021, um, uh, and Crew Carbon, which is another um, interesting uh, company based out of coming out of Yale that does containerized mineralization. Um, so lots of great This is CDR episodes coming up. Next week, um, Arbor with uh, CEO Brad Hartwig and Andres Garcia-Clark, who is the CTO, um, and the same time next week. So that's it. Um, thank you for being with us. Thanks again to Scott and Hannah for a great discussion, and everyone be well, and we'll see you in a week.